And I was interested in how human beings use natural, their natural resources around them, specifically plants. Um, and so I worked in northern Guatemala with a group called the Kekchi Maya um, in the lowland tropical forests of, of the Paten and the Alta Verapaz in Guatemala and was interested in how they made a living through plant-based technologies. Yeah. Welcome everyone to this week's episode of The Sea Has Many Voices. I'm Dr. Greg Stone and I'm here at College of the Atlantic, a very special place for me in Bar Harbor, Maine, with the president of College of the Atlantic, which having been a student here has gotten a special status in my mind, like you're like, you know, the guy that <laughs> was up on the pedestal in those days. Darren, Dr. Darren Collins, and um, we're looking out over Frenchman's Bay, and uh, it's uh, right the it's right at the beginning of uh, what do you call it? Commencement. It's commencement. Commencement. Is commencement. Coming I would yeah. get that confused. Yeah. Commencement and no, it? it's convocation. 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 That's the word I was thinking. Of. Yeah, convocation. Yeah. <laughs> convocation. Which is a gathering of eagles. That's the yeah. plural form of eagles. Is a convocation of eagles. Is that where it comes from? Yeah, like a murder of crows, it's a convocation of eagles. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. that's really cool, I didn't yeah. know that. And I learned this morning from Katona that college comes from the Greek to gather. Yeah, that collect, yeah, yeah. that, make, that which, makes which sense. Yeah. But, but anyway, we're, we're, we'll have fun with words in a bit here. So, uh, Darren, tell me about yourself. Uh, I, my listeners are interested in your I want to hear your journey. I'm interested too. I actually don't know it all that well, although I've enjoyed working with you a lot recently. We'll get to that later. But. Great. Yeah, so thanks for having me, Greg. Yeah. And um, I was born in New Jersey, in like ultimate suburban New Jersey, like the hotbed of marine science um, in the, on the East Coast. <laughs> but actually, uh, yeah, not near the Jersey Shore. You know, it was a commuter place from, for, for New York, and it was very stereotypical suburban, but um, my mother, like, had this huge influence on me in terms of a love and passion for the outdoors and would hmm. help me seek out any little corner of woods that may have been left over from did development. She, did she create the interest, or did she stimulate it? I think both? she was a, a model. Like, she had it herself, hmm. and... I had it in me genetically, but also learned it through her. And so, even though I was, you know, grew up in this uh, concrete, suburbanized environment, like early on, my love was for the the outdoors. And um, you know, I'm the first one in my family to go off to have gone off to college. And so, at 18, when the time was right to go search for a college, um, I didn't really have much guidance as to what that would look like, although I knew I loved the outdoors and I was passionate for the environment. And those are really the two things that I Reminds had. me of E.O. Wilson, comes yeah? to mind, because he grew up in New York City. Yeah. I don't know if you knew that. And, and I didn't know that, no. And he, he got his love of nature from the park and the Natural History Museum. Yeah. And then, of course, he went on to become one of the world's great um, evolutionary biologist. So you came from an urban environment and you searched the nature out and, and that led you to College of the Atlantic, right? It did. I mean, I would say I was even worse off than E.O. Wilson. I didn't have a museum to go to or, um, but, but my dad had this friend that went to Bowdoin, yeah. right, which is Bowdoin's right down the, right down the coast and Brunswick. And right. so in his mind, Maine and environment went hand in hand. So we went on this father-son trip up to Bowdoin College and he got out of the car and saw Bowdoin and said, this is it, right? This is this must be a perfect collegiate environment with the greens and the columns and the ivy growing up the walls. And I said, you know, Dad, I'd read about this other place called College of the Atlantic up a little bit further up the coast. Can we go check it out? And he said, sure. So we got in the car, pulled into the front entrance here, and I got out of the door, and I stood face to face with this massive finback whale skull that you know. I knew that whale. Right? <laughs> you knew the whale. And I turned to my dad, and I said, this is where I want to go to college. And he said, 
what the hell is this place? You know, <laughs> like he, he, it didn't line up with what college meant. We're a very different institution. And this was back in 1987. And that's what brought me to College of the Atlantic. He learned to love it. I had four of the most extraordinary years like you, like yeah, you did. Like and I, I, I have both, to say, I'm an alum. When I got the, um, what they call the, you know, the, the curriculum program guide, and I was reading, you know, reading through it, and I came across this guy that had spent <laughs> loads of time underwater doing exploration, and his name was Greg Stone in 1982, and I said, that's the guy I want to be. I want to do I'm humbled. that. And I swear to God, Thank it's, it's, very, that, Darren, it's very true. And that, you know, I said, if I can do that here, that's where I want to go. And you know, we've had different paths. My, I'm not an expert on oceans. I spent then time doing a PhD in cultural anthropology. And I was in the tropical forests of Guatemala and the Amazon basin. Um, what, what is cultural yeah. anthropology? A cultural anthropology is the study of existing human cultures. You know, mm -hmm. here in the United States, um, compared to Europe, we look at linguistics, archaeology, cultural anthropology, and physical anthropology as, as the kind of four cornerstones of what it means to understand humanity. And I specialized in working with existing human cultures, so I wasn't interested in past human cultures or our biological evolution as homo what, sapiens. What's an example of a piece of cultural anthropology? I mean, just oh, Margaret Mead. She's the, you know, that's the, um, the archetypical cultural, cultural anthropologist. So it's uh, like the study of people's habits and yeah. their belief systems yep. and yep. their... And their material culture. And I was interested in how human beings use natural, their natural resources around them, specifically plants. Um, and so I worked in northern Guatemala with a group called the Kekchi Maya um, in the lowland tropical forests of, of the Paten and the Alta Verapaz in Guatemala and was interested in how they made a living through plant-based technologies. Yeah. I, I, I'm really interested in, you know, every, I've, heard, I've heard it said that everybody's like an armchair anthropologist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, anthropology is the study of humans, yeah. and everybody's interested in humans because we are humans. Yeah. And, but, so I I'm, I'm kind of want to push in on this a little bit. So a cultural anthropologist studies, is it only living cultures? Yeah, is it? yeah traditionally, yeah. So like if I were an archaeologist, I would be interested in human culture, but as expressed in past human I cultures see. by their material remains. When you spend time out in Polynesia working with people on how they navigate the Pacific waters, you are doing cultural That's anthropology. Cool. Okay. Yeah, okay. You're doing ethnography, which is the practice of cultural anthropology. Because yeah. you know, there's a story that I've been tracking that fascinates the hell out of me. It's this, I think it's a physical anthropologist uh -huh. or archaeologist, you tell me, who's found these, those caves in Mossel Bay, South Africa, uh -huh. where they've got evidence of human habitation back yeah. 200,000 years. Yeah. And they've determined that that's when we started to live along the coastline and um, start to, to use human ocean resources. And they dig down, yeah. you know, 200,000 years yeah. in one spot. Yeah. They find, now they are, they're physical anthropologists? Yeah, or bio, they, biological anthropology, or arch, yeah, there's techniques in archaeology What's Jared? also. What kind of an anthropologist is he? Who's Jared, that? Jared Diamond. Oh, Jared Diamond. Well, Jared worked in Papua New Guinea early in the 60s yeah. on um, you know bird calls. He spent a lot yeah. of time, and so he did cultural anthropology. Okay. He was working with existing Trobrin Islanders, not Trobrin, the PNG Islanders, um, and so Jared would be a cultural anthropologist. And an ornithologist. Yeah, and a great he, ornithologist. Yeah, and he's yeah. a fellow guest of the show, too. I, I so, watch him, and so, uh, a hero of mine, for yeah, sure. Yeah, he's, oh, a, yeah. he's just a wonderful, dear friend of mine. I, yeah. I love Jared. Yeah. And um, he's, so, he's so humble, too, because when I, when I talk to him about stuff, I go, Jared, I'd like to talk to you about this or that. He said, well, great. All I know is about Papua New Guinea and birds. You know that, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. right yeah. <laughs> but all you have to do is, like, open the door, and right. he's, like, got uh, a, a world view. All yeah. right, so... Cultural anthropology yeah. after a human ecology degree, and they're That's kind right. of connected, aren't they? they human are. ecology yeah. and yeah. anthropology. Yeah. Never really thought about that until right now, yeah. actually. 
And where did you pick that up, the PhD? I did that at Tulane University Ooh, in New Orleans. That's which fancy. Had a, well, it was very different than my experience as an undergraduate at COA. I had a, I had a, a good, a great background at, uh, in anthropology at Tulane. And Tulane had a long history of doing more archaeological research on the Yucatan Peninsula and in Mesoamerica and throughout Guatemala. So the, uh, the institution had, a, had deep roots in that part of the world. And so um, I did work among an existing group of Mayan speakers called the Kekchi Maya. Spent a lot of time learning language because you can't really have a window into a, a, a group's culture without that language so background. So you became fluent in that. I did. That yeah, oh, I spent wow. two two years more or less in in northern Guatemala. I think you're right yeah. about that. You know, like the places that I've worked, uh, as you mentioned earlier, in the Pacific, those those that were, they're foreigners are called Imatang in the country that I tend to work in. Uh, they had went to learn the language. Yeah. They penetrated so deep yeah. and, uh, and made, made, interestingly, some of those foreigners that came in, learned the language, wrote books and all that kind of stuff, admittedly, they know the language better than the locals, I'm told, because they studied it. Yeah, in all grammatically. In its, right. its entirety. That's right. Rather yeah. than the colloquials that they'll have on each island. That's right. They'd say, oh yeah, that even, uh, man, he really knew uh, our language better than us. Right. <laughs> he can speak all these, these various stuff. No, but language, as you know, I mean, it's a total window into the world, and it was the most fulfilling part of my time in Guatemala was learning Kekchi and being there with my wife. Those two things opened up a world that would have been closed if I hadn't it's been... It's nice to share things with your loved ones, isn't it? Yeah, the funny story here, I'll tell you, is they... Uh, we were 20, I was probably 27, 28 years old at the time. We had, Karen and I just got married, moved to Guatemala, and the community was very worried about us because they said they saw we were married but we didn't have kids you know and they were the men would come up to me and they would say well darren um you know what you have to do to have children right <laughs> if you didn't understand the process <laughs> that's right they were worried about that and they were worried about my hair because i was already already losing my hair and so the women would have great a great time rubbing avocado <laughs> on my head and it didn't didn't work as a plant-based remedy for baldness did not work <laughs> but i had i loved my time in guatemala you know, i was working yeah. in an indigenous culture once and we were talking about conservation and the health of a wild population of animals yeah and, and it came down to describing it as if you want them to be healthy you stay out of their bedroom yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly just, <laughs> just you allow them to reproduce you them, and yeah. prosper yeah. so I, I know i know from my knowledge of you then you then you went to ww world wildlife fund that's right yeah so i graduated and i was fortunate to start work with world wildlife Fund, the wwf based in washington dc and i focused first on i was a the forest conservation coordinator for out th for throughout Latin America. So, um, you know, I knew Spanish and Portuguese and, and Kekchi at that time. So I um, I worked throughout the hemisphere, which was which was fun. And I had colleagues in Mesoamerica and Peru and Bolivia and Brazil and the Amazon and all the way down to the Valdivian forests in Chile. And I think it says a lot that WWF. You know, I wasn't an forestry expert necessarily. I had worked a lot in forests, but I was an anthropologist. And I think from, you know, one of the great things about WWF as an organization was that they understood that, you know, conservation was about human communities, like in understanding how people use natural resources and what was dear to them was absolutely crucial. So I, you know, yeah. <clears throat> you, know you and I both also share that work in the, in the world of large NGOs, or they're, yeah. they're co colloquially called bingos, yeah. big international NGOs. I was at Conservation International mm -hmm. here at WWF. Mm -hmm. And I was there for the mission shift at CI when we went from a focus on biodiversity to a focus on providing human well-being yeah. through biodiversity, yep. which is what you just kind of referred to there. And uh, it, it came naturally to me, and I was new to the organization when it happened, but it caused a big chasm the ground moved in the organization and a bunch of people left. Yeah. People that loved uh, species, that yeah. loved wildlife, yeah. felt that we were going against the original doctrine 
uh, because we were not looking at, the bottom line wasn't conservation of species, the bottom line was providing benefits to humans yeah. on a sustainable basis. Yeah. And to me, that's the paradigm that has emerged in the world where uh, that's where we need to focus. It's not about, it often is the same, but at the end of the day, with the poverty, with the f nutritional problems in the world, with the social problems in the world, uh, we, can't, we, we can't take our eye off the needs of humans, the, the, the children, especially the poorer, poorer communities in the world. So conservation turned into a development uh, program really more than a conservation effort in, yeah. in my experience. Yep. I think you and I were probably uh, uh, experiencing that in, in different ways uh, at different organizations. Um, so you were at WWF and you rose to be a vice president or something pretty okay. high up. I didn't, I didn't have that title. I am um, um, building off what you, we always said and I think it's a great, a great catchphrase that hungry, poor people make very poor conservationists, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, if you don't simultaneously provide for, for human needs, you know. It's, it's, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna yeah. work. Yeah, yeah my, my old boss, Peter Seligman, used to say, and it was a good way to describe it, he said, we used to think that we could put biodiversity in a lockbox and it would be preserved. Yeah. But we found out that eventually people would go into the lockbox. Yeah. So, we brought people in at the at the start and integrated them in the system. Yeah. And only then, and, and with that arrangement, would the arrangement be be long term and sustainable. So. Yeah. So, you know, one of the premises of this show is that the ocean and humanity share the same fate. Yeah. It's kind of a simple way of putting it. Yep. Yeah.